we'll close our eyes as we pray our father we thank you very much for bringing us together thank you for granting us the privilege of leading your people we pray no lord will do the work to please you and to satisfy you in jesus name and we pray that our learning will not be in vain teach your people lord and grant us the grace and the strength to carry out the word and to do the work to please you in jesus mighty name we pray today we're looking at a very familiar passage but you might not have looked at it uh, concerning leadership before we're looking at daniel chapter 5 daniel chapter 5 i'm talking on the portrait of a good leader obviously everybody will agree anyone who has studied daniel that daniel was a good leader in fact he was a great leader he was number one approved of god number two he was appreciated by men and chapter five gives us some qualities of this good leader actually what you have in chapter five is the feast of belshazzar and the finger of god those two things describe to you what actually happened in chapter five number one the feast of belshazzar and without uh, going too much into the details of that there are three things to note about that feast number one the sensuality of the feast calling the concubines and the women and drinking and all those things number two the sacrilege of the feast taking the vessels of the house of the lord and drinking wine out of them number three the stupidity of the feast while the middle persians were outside the walls this man was feasting and the army wanting to take babylon wanting to take their headquarters they were right at the gate to enter so you see the stupidity of the feast and then you find the finger of god writing upon the wall and as the finger of god wrote upon the wall the king's frivolity was turned into fear the king's frivolity was turned to fear and now he needed an interpretation interpretation of what was written on the wall and eventually daniel came in and it's in this uh, coming in of daniel that we see the leadership qualities of daniel shining forth for our learning tonight there are three points we're going to see as we look at this number one the characteristics of a good leader the characteristics of a good leader number two the conviction of a good leader the conviction of a good leader number three the courage of a good leader let's come to number one now we're in daniel chapter five and we're reading from verse 10. you i need to connect you with the story now the king already had seen the finger writing and what he saw on the wall troubled him because he couldn't make any interpretation out of it and yet it struck him like a thunderbolt he knew that something was deadly wrong and he knew that something mysterious was happening he called all the Chaldeans and Susias together and they couldn't give him the interpretation. And then now verse 10. Now, the queen by reason of the words of the king and his lords came into the banquet house and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. And now she was going to talk. She is going to talk about Daniel. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy God is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and so on. In this part, we see the characteristics of a good leader. Number one, a good leader is a significant man. Number one, a significant man. And you see that about Daniel. Don't you see that in verse 11? There is a man. A man among other men. A man that was singled out. A man that had recognition. 
A man that has solution to problems when other people do not have solution to such problems. In chapter 1 of uh, John, verse 6, that's exactly how you have the description of John. It says in John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And that's the characteristic of a good leader. When other people fail, and when they do not have any word, when they do not have any solution, that we can say, there is a man there. There is a woman there. And that means that the leader is a significant person. We now come to, Jer we come to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, Yet my mind could not be toward these people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. You'll find that Moses and Samuel were spoken about, about uh, as significant people. And so if you're a leader, you must be singled out. There must be that significance in your life that marks you out. You can say, you can do, you can plan, and you can think through other things that other people cannot think through. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Brings you to what I said before, that Daniel was approved of God and appreciated by men. Come back to Daniel chapter 5. Number 2, he was a spiritual man. Number 1, significant. Number 2, spiritual. In Daniel chapter 5, reading from verse 11. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom, the spirit, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Actually, what's written there when it says of the holy God is like the triune God that is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then this queen said, as we look at this Daniel and as we examine the life of any other good leader, that leader will be a spiritual man. And that's exactly the qualifications we're looking for in the scriptures if we want to be a good leader in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. In the work of the Lord, we need to find men who are full, saturated of the Holy Ghost. It's not enough to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Quite a number of people have been baptized in the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. But some vessels leak a lot by talking too much. And by things that are not scriptural that people do, they leak. And then they are no more full of the Holy Ghost. Even though they were filled of the Holy Ghost before. But we are still looking for people that are full of the Holy Ghost. Number three, he was a superior man. Come back to uh, Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5 verse 11. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, divine wisdom, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king I say thy father, made master of the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, a superior man, somebody elevated above the ordinary people in understanding, in intelligence, in courage, in commitment, in faithfulness, in everything that you will require. In men of ability, he was above the rest of the people. And then number four, a sensible man. Why do we say he was a sensible man? Look at Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 5 and see it from verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpretation of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving doubts were found in the same Daniel. This man was a sensible man. He had sense to know what to do, sense to counsel, sense to direct, sense to be able to tell us what we ought to do. If we're going to be good leaders, 
approved of God, appreciated by men, there should be that kind of knowledge and wisdom and understanding in First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Here we find a quality that is very important in leadership. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Those were the people that were made heads, leaders, supervisors, and the people to guide the rest of the children of Israel. They knew what Israel ought to do. That's the qualification of the characteristic we need to find in ourselves too. And then number five there is skillful man. Come back uh, to Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, the latter part of verse uh, 12, it says, And dissolving doubts. Dissolving doubts. And then in verse 16, I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. So then you understand the characteristics of a good leader. And it's now for you to check up in your own life. Are you a significant man? You know, there are some people, if they are not in the meeting, you wouldn't even know that the meeting, that they are not there. Because the meeting can go on, you can get everything you want to get without their being there. How significant are they? When somebody is significant, that you know that he will contribute something definite and positive to the meeting. Not significant. And then spiritual. You are saved. You are sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you remain filled and full and saturated of the Spirit of God. Then, number three, superior. You are above the rank and file of the people. That's why the pulpit is above the congregation. To signify or to symbolize that the person standing on that pulpit, as he is physically above the people, so must he mentally and spiritually too, he must be above the people. He's a superior man, a sensible man. He doesn't do things that are unreasonable. Things that are not sensible. Things that you'll say, how can a leader talk like this? How can a leader behave like this? How is he doing this? Even ordinary people should not do like this. And then it should be somebody that has skill to counsel, skill to direct, skill to lead, to dissolve doubts, and to resolve conflicts. We come to number two. The conviction of a good leader. The conviction of a good leader. And then we now read in verse 17, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, verse 17. And then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known unto him the interpretation. You may not think there is much in that verse I've read to you now, but there is much there. First of all, Daniel, he was not there before. He didn't push himself forward. He wasn't looking for position. He wasn't looking for recognition. He was in his place until all the Susias and all the people failed, and they called him. It's only when they called him, he showed up. Isn't that significant that we stay in our place, we remain in our corner, and we're not like Absalom that wants to grab a place for ourselves. We're not like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram that wants to usurp the authority of leadership. We stay in our place, and if they can do it without us, praise the Lord. If the work can be done without our contribution, praise the Lord. If God has had another alternative, and that alternative is doing it, praise the Lord. But if there is no alternative and they find that we're significant, we're skillful, and we're sensible, and we're spiritual, and we're spirit filled, and there is none like us, they are ordinary and they count us as extraordinary. And then they call us, when they call us, very promptly we come. And then, as the king promised that was going to give him gift, he said, Please keep your gift to yourself. Isn't that conviction? Doing the work of God, not because of what you can get or gain, but because of what you can give. It is not what you gain, it's what you give. It's not what you get, it's what you give. So the man said, Daniel said, keep your gift. I'm not here for gift. I'm not here for pay. I'm not here for remuneration. Yet I will give the interpretation unto you. Daniel was a man of conviction. He served not because of gifts or gain. Daniel had conviction and his service was done out of that conviction. You know, it's impossible to stand 
For true conviction, if you are seeking position, you won't be able to have conviction because already you are in politics and you'll be doing things to please the people to vote for you and to put you there and to accept you. You will not be doing it with conviction. Number two, you will, if you are not going to have, if you are going to stand with true conviction, you will not be a person interested in gain, interested in give. You'll be interested in only what you can give. Number three, your motive will not be the praise of men or the recognition of men. Number four, the message will not be modified by the personality of the person you're speaking to. That's what you'll find in Daniel. He said, I'll give you the interpretation. I will not modify it. Even though you are a king, I'm going to tell you exactly as it is without looking for anything. That's what we find in Abraham. In uh, Genesis Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, we find what uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham told the king of Sodom in verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from the thread even to issue lashes, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I made Abraham rich. That's the attitude of a person that has conviction. I have conviction about the promise of God. He will promote me at the right time. I have conviction about the provision of God. He will supply all my need. I have conviction about what the Lord has told me. He has put me into the service and I will not be getting something from the people to close my mouth or to blind my eyes. That is conviction. That's what you'll find in Samuel. For Samuel chapter 12. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, reading from verse 3, it says, Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. And he said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. The question is, are you like that? Can you really stand and say, you don't care what the people give, and you are not uh, doing a service of partiality in your district, in your location, or in your local church, uh, because of this fellow coming around giving you this and giving you this, and trying to be familiar. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. That's conviction. And that's the conviction a child of God ought to have. And as we're talking about coming back to a revival of holiness, bringing the church back to where we were before, if it's going to be possible, the leadership, the whole of the leadership must come with his conviction and say, we'll do the right thing, we'll say the right thing, we'll act the right way, we'll have the right motive, and we're not going to care what people give us or what people don't give us. The praise or the blame or the criticism or the commendation will not matter to us at all. We're going to do the will of God and say it as it should be said. Somebody said, conviction is a belief that you hold, which also holds you. Conviction is a belief which you hold and which also holds you. And that's what we find in Daniel. It's like uh, in one of our songs, in our hymn book, it says, Not for hope of great reward, turn men's hearts unto the Lord. Just to see a sick man smile makes the effort well worthwhile. It means that if we have conviction, we're not uh, hoping for reward, we're not hoping for remuneration, we're not hoping for pay, we're not hoping for anything, we just want to serve the Lord. You remember the song, So Send I You? One of the stanzas says, So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, to serve unloved, to serve unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, and to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. It takes conviction then to serve the Lord, Daniel added, and to walk with pure motives without seeking a higher place, without seeking a higher position, without seeking prestige, without seeking praise, the praise of men, without seeking popularity or fame, without seeking power, great authority, and without seeking public recognition. I come to number three, the courage of a good leader. 
We come to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And now we come to verse 18. Daniel 5, verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him all people, all nations and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind had in them pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And then he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. Number one, he revealed the history of the kingdom. He revealed the history of the kingdom. If we are going to be competent leaders, good leaders, great leaders, useful leaders, effective leaders, we need to know our Bible very well. And we need to know the history of the world very well. And when we talk, they called him impromptu. And it wasn't that he even prepared an outline. And then he gave a review of the life of his father to drive the point home unto him. You don't have the time to read Acts chapter 7, but write it down. When you get back home, try and find time and read Acts chapter 7. You will find something in Acts chapter 7 they called Stephen. And then the elder said, Stephen, is this thing so? And then he began. He began from the time of Abraham in Mesopotamia. How God called him from the awe of the Chaldees. How he came out. How God made a covenant with him. And then came to Isaac, Jacob and, uh, Isaac and Jacob. And then he came to the time of Moses. He came to the time of the judges. He came to the time of the kings. And the time of Solomon. And the time of building the temple. And then he came to the time of Jesus Christ. The just one, the holy one. He came to the crucifixion. And then he nailed it on them and he said... Your stiff neck. He revealed the history. And so, if we are leaders, you will know your Bible. And knowing the Bible will mean that you will read the Bible. You will meditate the word. And you will be able to give it out at the appropriate time. So, we find what Daniel did. Number one, he revealed the history of the kingdom. Number two, he reverenced the Most High God. He reverenced the Most High God. You find that in the latter part of verse 21, Daniel chapter 5. He said, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. He reverenced the Lord. He honored the Lord. That's what we are to do in our message. We are not just to cringe and bow and bend before the people. What are we to do? We are to reverence the Lord, honor the Lord in a very special way. In fact, your message and your preaching will be a part of your own service and of your own worship to the Lord. In uh, Psalm 22, verse 28. Psalm 22, verse 28. Talking about the Lord. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. He is the ruler. He is the sovereign. He is the judge. He is the guide. He is the governor among the nations. Number one, he revealed the history. Number two, he reverenced the Most High God. Number three, he rebuked the king for his sin. Come back to Daniel chapter 5 verse 22. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest, thou knewest all this, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold and of brass of iron, wood and stone. We see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God of heaven and the God in whom thy, in whose hand thy breath is, whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Here we find that he rebuked this king for his sin. 
And there are three parts of the sin. Number one, premeditated sin. Belshazzar thought about it. He called all the people together, brought the wine together. And then he said, for the cause, uh, the utensils of the house of the Lord. Premeditated sin. Number two is profane sacrilege. Profane sacrilege. That he is taking holy things and using them not just for common things, but defiled, immoral, corrupt, idolatrous things. Number three, pagan sacrifice. He said, you have sacrificed and you have offered to the God of gold and of wood and of stone and of brass. The God that see not and you have not honored the king, you have not honored the God of heaven. In whose hand your breath is. Premeditated sin, profane sacrilege, and then pagan sacrifice. Now, this number three is very important. A, a, a preacher, a good leader, must be able to rebuke sin. And you rebuke it forcefully and directly without fearing whether those people you are rebuking, the sinners, whether they frown or whether they'll take it or not. In First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 20 and verse 21. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. That's the scripture. And this is an age, a generation. When people don't like correction, they don't like rebuke, but the word of God stands. And therefore you will still abide by the word of God. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Come back to Daniel chapter 5. Now we see he revealed the meaning of the message. He revealed the meaning of the message. Daniel chapter 5, reading from verse 25, and this is the writing that was written. Many, many take a euphasin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many. God has numbered thy kingdom and has finished it. Your time is up. Your cup is full. You've been given a long rope. You've come to the end of that rope. You know what to do. You've not done it. You have consistently rebelled against the Lord. Now there is no day of grace. It's finished. And then in verse 27, take him. Thou art weighed in the balances, and thou art found wanting. You have been weighed in the balances of the commandments of the Lord, of the purpose of the Lord, of the goal for which you were created, of the goal for which the purpose for which you were king over the throne. You have been weighed in the balances, and you have been found wanting. You have not measured up to the expectation of the Lord. Parents, thy kingdom is divided and given to the meats and the passions. It says now it's over. And then the kingdom is divided. You will not be able to continue anymore. He revealed the meaning of the message. It was a terrifying interpretation. But he gave it. That's the faithfulness of the preacher. In Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have convenient season, I will call for thee. As he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, self-control, and of the judgment to come, there's an eternity that everyone will face. We're told that Felix trembled. We must be so faithful in declaring the word of God. That the people who hear will tremble if they need to tremble. They will trust they will if they need to trust. And then they will have the blood of Jesus washing and cleansing them. We'll see today the challenge from Daniel's character, from his conviction, from his courage. And you want to know that those things were the products of his prayer life. When you spend much time in prayer, in God's presence, that will affect you. It will affect your leadership positively. Then... Your character will become purer. Your conviction will become more piercing. And your courage will become more prominent in life as well as ministry. We've seen about Daniel today. And even though our time is gone, we still need to take it to the Lord in prayer. What kind of leader are you? Are you significant in that your location? Are you spiritual in that place where you are ministering? Are you superior to other people or are you making uh, mistakes when you are preaching that even the ordinary members will be correcting you as a leader there? Do you have skill? And are you sensible? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I want to be the kind of leader I ought to be. 
I want to be the kind of leader I want to be. Do you have conviction? It's your condition that you hold, that will hold you. You're not looking for gain. You're not looking for the praise of men. You're not looking for reward. You're not looking for appreciation. You're not seeking for position. You're not seeking for privilege. You're not seeking for power. You're not seeking for uh, the public attention, public recognition. You're not seeking for anything. You just want to render your service unto the Lord. Do you have courage? Can you review that history like Daniel did it? Can you rebuke the people without looking at their position? They are rich. They are royal. Whatever they have. Can you tell them what it means to be saved and to be born again? Can you preach straight forward holiness message without holiness? No man shall see the Lord without looking at their faces. Do you have the courage to reveal, to reveal, to rebuke, and to tell them what they ought to be and what they ought to do? If you're always under the fear of man, you will not be able to serve the Lord. Look unto the Lord. Say, Lord, make me like Daniel. Make me like Daniel. Even though sometimes he had to go to the lion's den, he kept his courage, he kept his conviction, he kept his character. And you remember the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It wasn't easy. They had to get into the fire, but he kept their character, and he kept their courage, and he kept their conviction. Being a leader is not a bed of roses. It may come, it may come with suffering. But you are still able to serve the Lord. And you preach it the way you ought to preach it.